Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. Father, we come into your presence now. And many of us know what it is like to be blind spiritually, not able to understand your love, not able to understand the meaning of the cross and the power that it is to change our lives. And many of us know, Lord, what it is to finally have the blinders removed so that we can see so that we can begin even dimly to comprehend your love which is so deep and high and wide. I would pray that in these next few moments as we open your word that you would connect us with that love even more, that you would open our eyes even wider and that you would give us greater understanding and appreciation, Lord, for your amazing grace. And I would pray that it's not just a rehearsal or a simple exercise that we go through, but Lord, that it is transformative, that your word gives light and it gives life. And I would pray that those who are dead in trespasses and sins would be quickened and raised in newness of life today because of the time that we spend in your presence. Thank you, Lord, for being here, for being a loving father and for welcoming us with open arms. We stand ready to receive and to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath, church. Have you been blessed so far? Oh, you can do better than that. Have you been blessed? Amen. Amen. The Spirit of the Lord is in this place. And I want to give a shout out to um, uh, Bupe. Uh, Bualia, her older sister, read the scripture for us just now so beautifully. And um, Bupe is not with us today. She was having some struggles last night with her seizures. Just continue to lift her up in prayer. And if the family is watching, we send our love uh, to you, praying for you. Our message today is Lost and Found, Part 3. Oh, and I should say, my family is here uh, visiting today uh, from Idaho. All three of my daughters are here. And my grandkids, and my son-in-law, and my daughter's boyfriend. We've got them all here. And uh, we're just excited. There's a wedding taking place tomorrow for a family friend. And they all came up for the wedding. And... um, They were all in the house last night. We didn't get a lot of sleep, but that's all right. We're happy. We're happy. We're glad that they could join us. Lost and Found, Part 3, The Father's Heart. The third of the three stories that Jesus told. This one about a son. I have in my hands a letter. I want to read it to you. It was printed in the Fargo forum newspaper this week and I entitled it a father's letter to the forum newspaper of Fargo about his prodigal son my name is Pierce Teft and I'm writing to all with regards to my youngest son Peter Teft an avowed white nationalist who has been featured in a number of local news stories over the last several months. On Friday night, my son traveled to Charlottesville, Virginia, and was interviewed by a national news outlet while marching with reported white nationalists who allegedly went on to kill a person. 
I, along with all of his siblings and his entire family, wish to loudly repudiate my son's vile, hateful, and racist rhetoric and actions. We do not know specifically where he learned these beliefs. He did not learn them at home. I have shared my home and hearth with friends and acquaintances of every race, gender, and creed. I have taught all of my children that all men and women are created equal, that we must love each other all the same. Evidently, Peter has chosen to unlearn these lessons, much to my and his family's heartbreak and distress. We have been silent up until now, but now we see that this was a mistake. It was the silence of good people that allowed the Nazis to flourish the first time around, and it is the silence of good people that is allowing them to flourish now. Peter Teft, my son, is not welcome at our family gatherings any longer. I pray my prodigal son will renounce his hateful beliefs and return home. Then and only then will I lay out the feast. His hateful opinions are bringing hateful rhetoric to his siblings, cousins, nieces, and nephews, as well as his parents. Why must we be guilty by association? Again, none of his beliefs were learned at home. We do not, never have, and never will accept his twisted worldview. He once joked, the thing about us fascists is, it's not that we don't believe in freedom of speech. You can say whatever you want. We'll just throw you in an oven. Peter, you will have to shovel our bodies into the oven too. Please, son, renounce the hate. Accept and love all. And that was printed on August 14 at 8.21 a.m. Can you hear the anguish of a father whose son is lost? An embarrassment to the family, dragging their family's name in the dirt. He said, I pray my prodigal son will renounce his hateful beliefs and return home. You can't tell me this morning, friends, that the Bible is not relevant. It's not just a book of nice stories that we uh, teach in Sabbath school with flannel graphs. It speaks to the issues of the day. It speaks to the human condition. And it is as relevant in 2017 as it ever was when Jesus first told the stories. The final story in Jesus' Lost and Found trilogy is about another family's heartbreak and distress, and it ups the ante of emotion because it involves people, not property or pets. It starts out, there was a man who had two sons. Right away, we know that this is a story about relationships. And in the East, no relationship is stronger or has more meaning than that of a father and a son. Verse 12, the younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Now, us here in the West, we read that story and, and we don't read it with the shock. And, and, and with the um, uh, surprise at which Jesus' hearers heard the story. Because in the East, the only way a son gets a share of the inheritance is upon the death of the father. So to ask for your share while the father still lived was to say, in essence, I wish you were dead. It would be like Peter Teft saying to his father, I'd like to throw you in an oven. It's unthinkable disrespect and ingratitude. The older brother was also there. Remember, the story starts, there was a man who had two 
sons. The story is not just about one, it's about both. We'll take up the other one in part four, but today we're focusing on the younger brother. The older brother is present during this dialogue, but his silence in the narrative is deafening. And it illustrates his refusal to be the mediator between the father and the younger son. You see, this was the older son's role. In the pecking order of the family, if there's a dispute between the father and younger siblings, the eldest son is to act as go-between, mediator, try to resolve the conflict in the family. But the son says nothing. He remains silent. And this gives us an insight into the status of the family, the dysfunctionality that is present. For some reason, the older brother doesn't want reconciliation to take place. Even if he hated his brother, he would still fulfill this mediatorial task for the sake of his father. But his silence reveals that things are not as they should be between him and his brother or him and his father. In the letter, it said it was the silence of good people that allowed the Nazis to flourish the first time around. When the church is silent in the face of sin, there's something broken in its relationship with both God and man. Something is off. The father in the story does what no one in the village expects him to do, and that is he grants the request. A second shock for those who are hearing the story. He's expected to refuse the request and to punish his, his son who has the brashness, the boldness, the ingratitude to ask such a thing. William Temple says that God grants us freedom also, even to reject his love. He gives us that right. He gives us that choice. The man in the story does not sever his relationship with his son as the father in the letter does. There is no shunning. The relationship is broken because of the son's actions, but the father holds on to his end of the cut cord, hoping that the other end can yet be joined. And in this, he suffers. Look at this statement, Kenneth Bailey. The father's suffering provides the foundation of the possibility of the son's return. It's his suffering that actually opens the door that leaves a path for an eventual return. But I want you to think this morning about how that father suffers. Oh, how he suffers. How he would long for that relationship to be restored, and yet he has to let the son go and work out his own salvation with fear and trembling. And you know the father knows that it's not going to go well. You know, he knows that there's trouble ahead. And yet, he has to hold himself back. I was thinking this week about God in the great controversy. Because there's a question that's asked many times. And I asked it this week myself. I said, you know what? If I, as a father, and think about you parents. Come on, you know you've asked this question before. If you, as parents, could... If you knew your children were about to engage in something that was detrimental to them, that was going to hurt them, you know if it was within your power to do something, right, you would do it. You would intervene, right? So many times we, both believers and unbelievers, question God. We say, well, God is a God of love. He's all-powerful. He's all-love. 
Well, if I would intervene, if I would get in the path of a speeding car, or if I would intervene and stop a person from taking drugs, or if I would jump in the middle and prevent them from hurting themselves, then how could this God, who is all love and all powerful, not do the same? How could he not intervene and stop that drunk driver or stop that um, drug pusher from getting to my child? or prevent that accident from happening, right? Let's be real here. You've asked that question. And I thought of it this week, and I began to wrestle with it when I, talked about the, when I thought about the suffering of the father with the prodigal. Because watch this. It's true. God does have all power, and he is all love. But he... Because he is love, he has created his universe with freedom of choice. And God himself, listen to me now, is bound by the rules of engagement in the great controversy. The law was broken. The wages of sin is death. God, the Almighty One, has to respect the choice that we make to either turn away from him or not and the consequences and all of its many ripples that follow and so to be God not not sinful humans like we are but to be God and to have to withhold himself from intervening to prevent the hurt and the tears and the anguish and the suffering and the sorrow of his dear ones. What kind of suffering is that on the heart of God? When we think about our children and those that we love, we have an ocean of love for them, and yet we may only have one child or five children or even ten children to, to love and to care for like that. And God has multiplied billions in which he loves so much that he died on the cross for them, right? So imagine holding himself back. How did the father feel when he couldn't penetrate the gloom of the cross to assure his son on the cross that he still loved him. When he had to let that separation take place and hear his son cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he could not go and comfort him. And that's multiplied billions of times over. And when the great controversy is finished, and when he wipes every tear from your and my eyes, I wonder, will God the Father's eyes ever be dry? Because those places at the table for his lost sons and daughters will remain empty. Oh, how the Father suffers. And he watches his son go off into the far country doesn't know if he'll ever see him again or not. And so the story sets up with the selfishness of the younger son, the silence of the older son, and the suffering of the father. Verse 13, not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. He didn't live according to the family's values or rules. He turned his back on everything that his father and their family stood for. He threw their value system in the dust and adopted a whole nother way of life. He squandered his wealth. That word there in the Greek, the phrase, got together all, it literally means turned everything into cash. Okay, so he liquidated his assets whether he went with sheep or goats or, or, or camels or donkeys or whatever, he liquidated his assets, turned it into cash. The New English Bible translates the verse, a few days later, the younger son turned the whole of his share into cash 
and left home for a distant country. Now, in the first century, if a Jewish boy lost his family's inheritance among the Gentiles and dared to return home, the community, this is what would happen. The child would come home, remember, having squandered his wealth among the Gentiles. He would come home and he wouldn't be allowed to go into the house right away. He'd have to sit at the gate. And sitting at the gate, the village elders would come out with a large ceramic pot. And they would break the pot in front of the young man, shatter it into a thousand pieces. That is called the kazaza. It means the cutting off. And they would say as they broke the prod in front of him, you are cut off from this family, from this village. We have no more part of you. Now, sometimes the mother of the son would come out of the house and be present to watch what goes on. You can imagine her heartbreak at the Kazaza ceremony. The father would never be there. The father would be in the house, supposedly angry and waiting for his moment when he might come face to face with his son. And it wasn't always going to be a pleasant, you know, welcome home celebration. No, the father was supposed to be angry and he would stay in the house and he would wait for this kazaza to go on before he would even entertain the son coming to him. By selling his inheritance and taking it with him, the prodigal takes a very huge risk. If he loses that money among the Gentiles, he burns his bridges. And he has no way of returning home. He has no more rights to claim and no one will take him in. How many sons and daughters of God are there who believe that they've burned their bridges with God and have no way to return home? They're embarrassed. They feel like they've gone too far. And that we, the older brothers and sisters who remained, would never take them back in. If only such people knew how many remained in the building but have departed in their hearts. You and I, we've got to let them know that they're not cut off. That the Father loves them and we love them. And it's safe to come home. Amen? Now, apparently, the prodigal meant to burn his bridges behind him because he wasted no time squandering the money. He didn't even try to save it. He just blew through it like it was nothing. Many people today treat the blood of Jesus as if it was nothing. The values and the love of God are tossed aside and wasted. I remember reading a letter from a meth addict who was in jail for assault. The interviewer asked him who he assaulted, and he answered, my mom. The interviewer asked him if his mom still loved him. He hesitated and said, I know my mom still loves me, but there is a limit even on a mother's love. He felt he had gone too far. The Bible asks the question, can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she is born? Though she may forget, he says, I will not forget you. The story teaches us that there's no limit to the father's love. The father's heart says, come home. Verse 14. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need <laughs> a famine a famine always comes doesn't it after the party there's the hangover after you've done your thing your thing generally does you in there's always a price to pay for leaving the father's house and even now our nation is paying for wasteful living and turning its back on god Judges chapter 21, verse 25, another very relevant scripture. It ends on this note, everyone did as he saw fit. Everyone had cast aside uh, the, the rule of law. 
and people made up their own rules. Are we not seeing that play itself out today? As people make up their own judgments, their own rules, and try to contextualize it according to their own ways of thinking. Judges, as you know, is not a very positive book. It demonstrates the result of everyone doing their own thing. The famine comes. Famines, even today, are devastating. Though we have aid agencies today and an international community that's available to raise funds, a famine is still a horror. But imagine what it was like in Bible times before such aid and communication was available. Randolph Con Carl von Slatten describes such a famine that occurred in 1889 in Sudan. I'm quoting him now. He tells of children being sold into slavery to keep them from starving. He speaks of people found dead every morning on the streets of Omdurman, the capital city. When the numbers increased, the rulers of the city declared every man responsible for throwing the dead in front of his house into the river. The inhabitants then tried to drag the corpses from in front of their houses over to their neighbors. Each morning, quarrels rang out across the city as men fought over where the dead really died. Merchants had to keep hippopotamus hide whips nearby to drive off the maddened beggars who would attack them bodily and ravish their shops. Small merchants with their wares on the streets would throw themselves across their wares as these miserable wretches came by. Unarmed men venturing out at night were attacked and eaten. Straying animals were killed and eaten raw. Shoe leather, rotten flesh, and garbage were all devoured. Even palm trees were consumed. Village families seeing death upon them bricked up the doors of their houses and awaited death in an inner room to keep their bodies from being devoured by hyenas. Entire villages were wiped out in this manner, end quote. Such are the horrors of famine. As we sit here just a few years ago, what was being called the worst humanitarian crisis in the world continued to escalate in the Horn of Africa where more than 13 million people were suffering the ravages of famine. Up to 1,200 people arrive at the refugee camps in Kenya every day. And as devastating as physical famine is, spiritual famine is even worse. Through the prophet Amos, the Lord declared that a famine was to come. Not a famine of food or of thirst for water, but a famine for hearing what? The words of the Lord. I believe that famine is upon us now. The stock market may be up, but the moral soul of our nation is down. So many voices claiming to speak for God, yet hearing the true word of God is becoming increasingly scarce. The words of man are dressed up to sound like the words of God, but it's like eating so much leather, so much rotten flesh and garbage. And where there is famine of the word, there is darkness. Isaiah 60 verse 2 says, see, darkness covers the earth and thick darkness is over the peoples. Darkness. But despite the famine and lack of food, the boy wouldn't go home. There were two reasons he wouldn't go home. Number one, he didn't want to endure his older brother's scorn. And number two, facing the village. He feared ridicule and lack of welcome even more than his circumstances. And consequently, he let his fear of the Father's house keep him from the love of the Father's heart. He didn't know his Father. He didn't know his Father. And how often this happens today. People who have left the church are so afraid of the reception that they will get from church members. They stay away and they cut themselves off from the love of God they so desperately want. We can never let that happen here. We must commit ourselves to connect those who are hungry for the word and for love with the heart of the Father who yearns to be with them. Amen? Amen. Verse 15. 
So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He joined himself, which means, the word there means like glue. He glued himself to a citizen of that country. It's kind of like the people who wash your windshield at a stoplight without your consent <laughs> and expecting payment in return. Uh, he needed to do something. He was desperate, and so he joined himself. He, he sold himself, if, as you were, to become a bond servant to this person in the country. And this citizen said, you know what? I don't have anything much for you to do. You go feed my pigs. Well, this was the ultimate humiliation because this is a Jewish boy. <laughs> and you know how the Jews feel about swine. It's an unclean animal. They're not to eat it. They're not to touch it. And now he is out feeding them. And if that's not bad enough, verse 16 says he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating. But no one would give him anything. He had reached bottom. He had reached a new low. He doesn't say that he ate the food that the pigs were eating, but he wanted to. He longed to. And, and, and yet no one would have any mercy on him. No one would give him anything. All the friends that he had when he was living high and he had money and he was paying for parties and paying for drugs and paying for women, it was all gone. The famine had come and those friends are no more. You know who your friends are, right? When you're down. Not when you're up. He's got nothing. And the Bible says in verse 17, he came to himself. There is a tipping point in life, and that is this. When the pain of staying the same becomes greater than the pain of change, that's when change happens. Most of us, we will not make a change in our life as long as the balance is the other way. It's too painful to change. I'll stay the same. Yes, I've got some hard times, some hardships. Things aren't always as great as they need to be. But you know what? It would be worse to change things up. Well, life arranges it so that that scale sometimes tips. And the change of, and the pain of staying the same is greater than that of change. And this is what happened to the young man. It became unbearable. And he said, look, verse 17, when he came to his census, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. Men. Now, many people, when they see that part of the story that says he came to himself, they assume that that was repentance. That the young man actually repented of his sinful ways. But it's more likely he came up with a plan to earn his way back into the Father's good graces. You see, he didn't un we already know he doesn't know the Father. He doesn't understand his heart. He assumes that his Father is angry and is a hard man and is going to do what most village fathers would do, which is to be harsh and stern and punish him. He assumes that because he doesn't know him. So he comes up with his own plan. He expresses no real remorse he only has a desire to eat. You understand he's suffering the consequences of his actions and it's painful. And so he is trying to come up with a way that he can get a meal. So he doesn't say, I shamed my family or I caused my father deep pain or anguish. He doesn't really feel any regret for squandering his wealth. Some Arabic versions have translated he came to himself as he got smart. He wised up. He figured that the only way to be restored to the family and the community was to pay back the money he had lost. 
but he has no marketable skills. And that's why his plan is to seek job training as a craftsman so he can join the workforce, save his money, and eventually repay what he lost. But he needs his father's backing to do this. So he planned to make a humble speech in the hopes of manipulating his father into giving the recommendation. He was making a forced teleprompter speech that he didn't really mean. The prodigal doesn't understand the nature of his sin. He thinks the issue, listen, he thinks the issue is the lost money. He doesn't understand that the issue is the father's broken heart. The issue is the relationship that's been broken. It's not the money. And this lack of understanding is at the root of all legalism and works religion. The problem is not broken rules, but the father's broken heart and a broken relationship. And there's no manipulating the father with a bunch of deeds that are supposed to impress him. There's no amount of tithe paying or giving to the poor or keeping of the Sabbath or, or any of those things that is going to somehow impress the father and say, oh, okay, my, my boy has repented now. I'll, I'll take him back. He's keeping my rules now. It is by, we sang it, and, and you played it, brother. Thank you. It is by grace you have been saved, not by works, so that no one can boast. No one can say, I did this. I earned my way. But the prodigal didn't want grace. He wasn't going to ask to be a household servant. You see, the household servants live off the estate. They eat from the kitchen and benefit from the father's estate. No, he asked to be a mystheos. A hired hand. He wants to earn a wage so he can pay his own debt. And this is why legalists never have the peace and security of their salvation. Because they don't know the heart of the Father. They settle for being hired servants instead of being sons and daughters of the Father. When we try to buy our Father's love, we reject an authentic son or daughtership that entitles us to everything the Father has. And you'll see that in part four when we talk about the older brother. We reject an authentic sonship that entitles us to everything the Father has. So verse 20. Verse 20. So he got up and went to his father. <laughs> The prodigal, remember, expects the father to remain aloof and angry in the house. That's what he expects. That's the tradition. That's what happens. He's expecting the kazaza to begin. As he is still a long way off from the village, he's anticipating the shaming that is about to commence. He can picture it. He's looking for the village elders to come with the pottery. He's waiting for the sound of it shattering at his feet. He's waiting to be cut off. Maybe he will see his mother in the crowd, but maybe he won't. And he knows his father is in the house, angry, waiting for him. He would be made to sit outside the gate of the family home before being allowed to even see his father. But now, the father breaks all rules of Eastern patriarchy. It says that while he was still a long way off, hadn't got to the village gate yet, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. Do you understand now what is going on? While he's still a long way off, he saw him and ran to him. He runs before the villagers can get to him. That's why he's running. 
He wants to intercept his boy before the kazaza, before the cutting off, before the shaming. I've got to get to my boy before this happens. And so he breaks with all the rules of paternity and runs for the boy. Something that a man, an adult man, in Eastern times never does. Zacchaeus did it too when he ran and climbed up the tree. That's shameful. Young boys run, but not older men. And so he gathers his robes about him, exposing his legs. Again, a shameful thing. The father, you have to understand, in running to the boy, is taking shame on himself. Because the villagers are looking at him with their mouths agape. They have the pottery in their hand and suddenly they see the father running past them and they're doing like this. He gets to the boy first. And notice this, he's not clean. He's not even repentant. He doesn't have his theology straight. He thinks God is an angry judge instead of a compassionate father. And yet despite his uncleanness, despite his lack of true repentance at this point, despite the fact that his theology is off, none of that keeps the father where he is. The father races to his son, embraces him and kisses him. He, he, he must gather his robes in his hands like a teenager. Uh, those who would be tormenting the prodigal are now distracted by the sight of this respected village elder shaming himself publicly. And it is his compassion that leads the father to race out to his son. He knows what his son will face in the village. The father's heart causes him to leave the comfort and security of his home. Listen. The father's heart causes him to leave the comfort and security of his home and humiliate himself before the village. And this is what God did in Christ for you and me. For you and me, Jesus endured the cross Scorning its shame, before we could be forever cut off from the Father's love, Jesus ran. He ran to this earth, took on the form of a servant, put his arms around us and loved us, and gave his life on the cross for us so that we would not have to suffer shame, so that we would not be cut off from the Father. And you can imagine all of those holy angels who also, by the way, not until the cross, really understood the love of God. They did not understand, really, truly, the heart of the Father. I'm talking about the faithful angels. They didn't really understand it until the cross. But can you imagine that as Jesus stepped down from heaven to become man, as he ran to us a long way off, the angels must have stood there going, What is he doing? What is he doing? And it wasn't until the cross and Jesus cried out, it is finished, that the angels understood. They understood the Father's heart. Verse 21, the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. The father cuts him off. He doesn't allow him to finish his speech. He doesn't allow him to, to, to go any further. The boy at this point is overwhelmed by the father's love. He makes an honest confession. Why? Because he was overwhelmed by the outpouring of costly love. The goodness of the father's heart leads to genuine repentance. And prodigals accept being found. Prodigals come home not under uh, driving force or under threat of punishment. They come because they're overwhelmed by the love of God. And after this costly demonstration, <laughs> no one in the village can reject or despise him. Look what he does. The father said, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger. That's that." That the family insignia, it means he's back and he's my son again. Put sandals on his feet. Slaves don't wear shoes. Only sons wear shoes. 
Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate for this. My son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so they began to celebrate. The love of the father was always there, but the boy never saw it until now. But now that love becomes visible, and for the first time, he's able to understand it. The cross is that visible demonstration of the heart of God that melts our hearts and enables us to understand his. He wasn't content just to tell us that he loved us. He knew we wouldn't understand, so the word became flesh and dwelt among us and died in our place so that we could come home and understand the Father's heart. Why such a costly gift? Because the value of what is lost determines the intensity and the effort to restore and reclaim it. Because God said you are worth it. He said you are worth it. Even in a far country, even a long way off, that means you don't have to have it all together to come back home. You don't have to have it all straightened out. All your theology straight and all your habits licked and everything dotted and crossed. Who, who, who has that? <laughs> who has it all together? All you have to do is want to come home. And nothing brings greater joy to the Father's heart than bringing his lost children home. And our brother Reuben can testify how good it feels to be home again. But there's still a lot of prodigals who don't know. And so this text, in closing, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us, to you and to me, the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. He's making his appeal through you and through me as we share what God has done for us we are revealing the Father's heart. This is our mission. God wants us to make his heart known to his prodigals, both inside and outside of the church. The reason for this sermon series is because I believe God is calling us to go get his kids. To fulfill our sacred responsibility and to be reconcilers of our lost brothers and sisters to the Father. It is our relationship with the Father that is revealed by our willingness or refusal to take up his work of mediation. It is out of love for being searched for, found, and restored to relationship with God that we in turn search for, find, and restore others to the Father's heart. He ran for us. Now it's our turn to run for him. Amen? Just before we pray, if you would take that pink card now and turn it to the back side where it says next steps. Next steps. And this is an expression of how God has been speaking to you in this message today. And you can check the appropriate box that expresses your heart. Number one, I know the price of leaving the Father's house, His heart, and want to come home now. If that's your desire and you want to come home, you check that first box. Number two, I reject the foolishness of trying to buy the Father's love and accept the gift of authentic son or daughtership. I recognize I can't buy it. I can't buy it with my works or my good deeds. The Father already loves me. So I reject that foolishness. Check box two. Number three, I accept God's calling to run for him and go get his kids. I want to run for him. And then there's space at the bottom there for the names of three people. We've asked you to do this before. We ask you to do it again. Three people who need Jesus. And if you could include for us this time, we didn't ask for it the first time, but if you could include some kind of contact information, uh, if you have it, an uh, email or a phone or whatever, we would just like to partner with you in contacting them, letting them know that 
we care about their relationship with God and that we are here to help, willing to help, if they will allow us to do so. Would you bow your heads with me and pray? Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this amazing love and your amazing heart. I am so sorry, Father, for your suffering. We suffer. We suffer on this planet. We suffer loss. We suffer pain. We suffer anguish. How much more do you suffer? Allowing the great controversy and our choices and all the consequences that it engenders to play itself out. But Lord, you have provided an end to the suffering. You have provided a way of escape. And it is in the cross of Jesus Christ. I pray if there's anyone here today who wants to reach out for that solution, that you would just raise your hand right now and say, I reach out for that solution. I want to be with the Father. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Father, you've seen the hands. You know our heart. We're trying to know yours. Help us to understand it better. Help us to be willing to run for you as you ran for us. Not pay attention to the shame of standing up for Jesus. But let us be reconcilers, ambassadors of your love to help lead others home. Thank you for your love and for saving us in Jesus' name. Amen.